Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of Encuentro Nacional de Computación 2021, organized by the Mexican Computer Science Society. I am Jasmine Hernandez, and I am honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Caroline Rossi. Before I introduce her to you, I would like to thank the audience for attending this talk. And also, I want to invite you to type in your question in the chat. Our guest speaker will ask, answer them by the end of the talk. I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Professor Caroline Rossier. She will dictate us the talk, Modeling Social Meaning as a Reflection of the Human Experience. I am really excited to introduce her because I first met her excellent work on tutorial dialogues in Y2 and Atlas Tutors when I was a PhD student. And her work was very important in my research since she is, since she is one of the most influential researchers in this topic. Dr. Caroline Rossier is a professor of language technologies and human-computer interaction in the School of Computer Science and Carnegie Mellon University. Her research program is focused on better understanding the social and pragmatic measure of, of conversation and using this understanding to build computational systems that can, can improve the efficacy of conversation between people and between people and computers. In order to pursue these goals, she invokes approach from computational discourse analysis and text mining, conversational agents, and computer-supported collaborative learning. Her research group highly interdisciplinary work published in over 270 peer review publications is represented in the top venues in five fields, namely language technologies, learning science, cognitive science, educational technology and human-computer interaction with awards on these four of these five fields. This, uh, she serves as past president and inaugural fellow of the International Society of the Learning Science, senior member of the IEEE, founding chair of the International Alliance to Advance Learning in the Digital Era, and co-editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Computer Supported Collaborative Learning. Please welcome Professor Rossi. Thank you, Professor, to be with us today. And thank you. I'm so excited to be here today to speak to this audience um, about modeling social meaning as a reflection of the human experience. So meaning of language is about where who, what, and how come together. I'm gonna to explain to you what I mean by that. The who is the person speaking or the audience that they're speaking to. The what is the propositional content of what is said. That's what we typically think of as the meaning. Also how, the style or the rhetorical strategy. And a lot of work in language technologies or natural language processing focuses on these two aspects of meaning, the what and the how, but not so much about the who. And what I want to do in this talk is to bring in the idea of the who, and I'm going to refer to that as social meaning. So again, that would be the person speaking and the audience. And the way that the speaker encodes something about what they want to project about themselves in how they speak and how that also reflects how they're positioning themselves with respect to their audience. Now, in natural language processing, you may be familiar with work in the area of machine learning called deep learning where meaning is encoded in terms of vectors of floating point numbers or sometimes ones and zeros. They represent um, where meaning is located within a multi-dimensional space. And this is very similar to ideas throughout the history of computer science, um, thinking about uh, older approaches like latent semantic analysis or latent Dirichlet allocation that you might be familiar with from generations of machine learning before deep learning. 
Other ways of encoding meaning might be formal representations like ontologies that are kind of hierarchies of concepts that represent things in the world or um, even abstract things that you might not be able to see and point to, but nevertheless understand that they exist. Or lexicons that are like dictionaries. They map between lists of words and lists of these concepts that might be represented in ontologies. And formal semantics is about formalizing rules that allow us to build up representations of me meaning, maybe from an extended discourse, many things that people might say. All of these ways of thinking about meaning locate meaning within the text of what is being said. And they make an assumption that, that meaning is kind of abstractable from the context in which it occurs. But social meaning doesn't really work that way. It, it's more dynamic. It relies on human ability to understand what people are referring to beyond what they literally say. Now, you don't have to take my word for this. George Lakoff and Mark Johnson are famous for their work in the book Metaphors We Live By, where they talk about how meaning is grounded in personal experience. And because of the commonalities we all share as human beings in the world, we're able to in, uh, imply things that people can figure out what we mean because of these commonalities. And we can be very indirect in how we communicate things. And we create ways that we can communicate things indirectly that become popular ways of speaking off the record. And these, because we're able to understand in context what people are referring to, these meanings are not necessary in the sense that it didn't have to be that way. It didn't have to be the case that, uh, that, uh, that for example, when we say because internet, um, that that is a way of speaking that's not just uh, treated as, as ungrammatical. It becomes a symbol and it refers then back to the history of times and contexts in which people have heard that expression or a form like that. And then it, it becomes associated with the meaning. And in some ways it's arbitrary. It didn't have to have been that way, but it isn't random. It usually makes sense. And it the reason why is because it's grounded in commonalities of personal experience. So Lakoff and Johnson in their book start with how it is that even met metaphors, metaphors that we use, there's a certain amount of systematicity that would suggest that perhaps we could take this abstractable approach of building ontologies and lexicons that define these creative or seemingly beautiful usages of language and just list them. Um, but then they reject that and they show a lot of evidence that points to the idea of how these things can um, be, they arise creatively and therefore they're specific to communities. And so they might not be mutually understood between different cultures. So let's take an example. This might not be um, an example that's very popular in the context that you're in, but hopefully um, it, it uh, can be understandable nevertheless. In the United States, there is a, there's a famous dolphin. Uh, you can see the picture of the dolphin here named Flipper um, from a, a movie, an old, old movie that a lot of people in the United States know about this movie. And so Flipper is, is, a, is, a, is a dolphin that people have heard of. And you might imagine that somebody might call somebody Flipper who has big feet. And then it could be understood as insulting to that person to call them Flipper because of the mutual understanding that this person is um, uh, uh, self-conscious about their feet. But if you call someone Flipper who is a, you know, just won an award for their swimming, then it can be understood as a good thing that you might be saying to that person. So the word flipper refers to a specific dolphin. 
but in specific contexts, it could be used as either an insult or as a compliment. And it's understood because of the context, and then it can be taken up and reused once it's understood to have a certain significance, a social significance. So let's talk about what uh, examples like this say about how we characterize social meaning and therefore in NLP, natural language processing, how do we, how do we use the idea of how social meaning works in language to be able to build models that function in social contexts. So I'm gonna talk about a model or actually two distinct models of social meaning. Both of them are wrong to some extent, but also both of them are partly right. It's kind of like the idea of light as a particle or a wave. They are useful for different purposes, but neither one captures the whole um, a meaning or the whole um, a, a concept correctly. So I would say that in the field of natural language processing, the most typical way that meaning is characterized treats it as though it's like a spice that you add to your food. So imagine this lasagna. Notice that it has layers. Language also has layers. There are concepts that we refer to in linguistics that point to specific aspects of language and how they build on one another to create the experience of language as we understand it. Social meaning, like that something is insulting or that something is a compliment, that it builds solidarity or treats someone as an outsider, that it associates someone with a particular identity like their political affiliation um, or sets them apart from someone else's. This we call the social meaning. And it's often been modeled as though it's a particle that's added to the language in order to signify things. And because of that, there's a lot of approaches in natural language processing that identify that there are certain words or linguistic elements that, um, that you can extract from the language and that should point to or predict what that social meaning is. There's a lot of work now in trying to detect things that are offensive. And again, um, these are treated as properties of words by themselves. But I've already pointed to the fact that language doesn't necessarily function that way. So even though there are a lot of words that you could probably list in your head, that those words by themselves have a negative connotation. Um, sometimes we can be very insulting in an indirect way where none of the words by themselves you would list in any kind of dictionary as necessarily having that insulting uh, connotation and yet um, they can be used to construct something that would come across that way. So rather than thinking of social meaning as a spice, in order to handle these creative ways that we might communicate these social standing of, uh, of who we're talking to and ourselves in that context, I'd like to think of it more in terms of wind as our alternative metaphor. And then we'll talk about the different aspects of that metaphor and what that says about how we might um, model this aspect of meaning in language. So if you think about these waves, you note that you can't actually see the wind, but you can see what it's doing. That isn't the wind that you see, but you know that there's wind there because of what it's doing. So I'd like to challenge you to think about social meaning, not in terms of what you see, where you see it in the words of a text, but in terms of what it does and what people do with it. And if we can model those things, we might be able to use social meaning, even if we can't point to a priori exactly where it is. So let's talk about some example work. I'm going to talk about a construct of language called transactivity. It's a property of collaborative discourse. You can see it in this example 
where people are talking. This is a computer science conference. So software engineering is an area that you're familiar with. This is a discussion where people are talking about an issue that has been reported about a piece of software. And you can see transactivity in this discussion about some code, trying to figure out what the problem is and how to address that problem. If somebody has a, a, you know, communicated an idea, a transactive reply is one that shows reasoning and builds on the reasoning in the earlier contribution. Usually we see, as is the case with this highlighted portion, that there's some elaboration um, because it will uh, communicate an idea in a way that refers back to earlier ideas that, um, that were said. And it says something about the underlying social currents in the interaction. Even though when you think about the definition, it's about something structural in uh, uh, what is being um, communicated. It, and, and, and also very cognitive in terms of being an argument and reflecting thinking. Uh, but on the other hand, there's this underlying um, social aspect of it which you could say is in, in a way somewhat hidden. Um, but we need to make that come out if that's what it is that we're trying to model. Now, transactivity is something that's been discussed a lot in the field of computer-supported collaborative learning. Because to the extent that we can measure how much of this is part of an interaction, we can make predictions about how effectively that interaction served as a place where expertise sharing happened, where, where quality collaborative products were produced and where learning occurred. It starts at its core building a shared understanding from a cognitive standpoint. And you can see that in the definition of reasoning, building on ideas, et cetera. But this is predicated or it depends upon more basic processes going on in the interaction, like deep listening, comparing of mental models, and sharing of insights. And these things, in turn, depend upon predispositions and attitudes like respect and interest and self-efficacy. On the other side, when these processes occur, as I have said, we see more learning, expertise transfer, and group task success. And also the feeling of being heard, of being part of a decision-making process. You can see then connections between what at its core is about ideas and from a cognitive perspective, how an argument is constructed but how it relates to social processes and attitudes and perceptions that are going on sort of underneath the current in the conversation. And you might not be able to see those undercurrents, but they're related to what's happening at a higher level. So one study that we have done that highlights this connection is to use dynamic Bayes nets in order to be able to process the speech signal from pairs who are arguing with one another. Now we analyzed this data from two levels. On one level, we looked at the sound signal and we looked for how people pronounced their words. And we measured what we um, would refer to as speech style accommodation. And that would be the extent to which as people are talking, they start to sound more like one another. When two people are interacting in a way that builds common ground, that shows openness, that is welcoming, we see more of these processes of speech style accommodation. You can detect them from the speech even if you don't know what the person has said. And so in this context, we worked with the speech signal using the dynamic base net to be able to measure how much style convergence we saw across um, conversations between pairs of students. On the other side, another student was analyzing the transcripts. So this was just what was said uh, in textual form 
looking for these transactive exchanges according to the definition. So that was at a cognitive level, looking at the extent to which people displayed reasoning and built their reasoning on the expressed reasoning from another person earlier in the conversation. Then we looked at how these numbers aligned, the measure of the speech style accommodation and the measure of the concentration of transactive behavior. And what we saw was a significant positive correlation between those two with an R value of 0.4 showing that it's true, that as we see more speech style accommodation reflecting the social environment of the conversation, we also see more transactive exchange, showing the connection between those layers in the interaction. From the other side, we also see when we see transactivity, can we from the transactivity that we see predict something about the social environment that allows us to make decisions about how to manage a large population of students. And for this work, we looked at massive open online courses where the students in those courses need to be divided into teams. And in previous work um, in uh, massive open online courses with teams, there had been a problem with identifying effective teams for people in the beginning of a course. And so we developed a paradigm like what you see here, where students come in and they start to learn something about the content first by themselves. Then they come into a discussion forum where they post something about their individual work. And then they're asked to pick some other students in the course that they see in the discussion forum to offer feedback to. And then we look at whether those feedback discussions include transactive exchange or not. In order to be able to use the concentration of transactivity exchanged between pairs of students as an estimate of collaboration potential. And once we have those estimates of collaboration potential, we can assign uh, the students in the class to teams in such a way that people are more likely to end up in a team with other students who bring out that transactive behavior in them. And we used that as a way of dividing the class into teams. And then across classes, we look to see whether um, that method of assigning students to teams led to better collaborative behavior that, and, and, and results than random team assignment. In order to do the division of the class into teams, we used a minimal cost network flow algorithm that would try to maximize the extent to which students in the same team assignment um, re had reflected this transactive behavior in the discussion forum. And so this was a partitioning of the class not that we only assigned students who were high in this kind of discussion behavior to teams. Everyone was in a team. The only question was, who would you be with in your team? So we ran this experiment in a large online crowdsourcing environment where we were able to simulate running multiple instances of the same course. And then we could, in some instances of the course, use random assignment to teams, and in other instances of the course, use this approach that um, maximizes the collaboration potential based on observed transactivity. And then we could compare across these instances of the course, on average, how well did the teams do in terms of writing a proposal together? And what we found was that when we used this method of assigning students to teams based on observed transactivity, they, um, they, uh, they interacted in their collaborative environments more transactively, and they also produced a better, more integrated proposal together. And this shows that you can predict something about how well people will be able to collaborate based on this collaborative behavior that you observed in the past between them in a different context. 
And so that shows the link in the other direction from the transactive behavior to the social environment that from which emanates better collaborative behavior. So our work overall is very focused on using conversational agents like tutorial dialogue um, agents that we heard about uh, when I was uh, being introduced. Um, here, not just to be able to teach individual students, but there were those conversational agents actually facilitate collaborative groups. You can see this environment where a student would come, they're sitting at their own computer and they're working with other uh, students who are remote from them. And they have this shared workspace, in this case where they're pasting in screenshots of analyses that they're doing on um, uh, from simulation environments. And on the right, we see the chat where they're chatting to one another through text. And all of these terms that are marked tutor are a conversational agent that's facilitating that interaction. And in earlier uh, evaluations of this, we saw that students benefited at almost one letter grade um, uh, benefit from working with another student, but also similar effect working with the tutor agent. And when we put those two together, students gained one and a quarter letter grades more than a control condition, where in the same environment, but without the support, a student was doing the same task. So since that early study, we have extended this technology to support collaboration um, at multiple levels and in multiple areas of learning. So middle school, high school, college level, also between math, science, engineering, and environmental sciences. In all cases, using these conversational agents and also detection of processes like transactivity in the chat as a way of offering a context sensitive form of interactive support. And over the years, we have worked to develop a number of design principles that we have used to guide how we design those conversational agents that offer the support. And at the core, the value is in, uh, is in supporting interactions like transactivity that are predicated on positive social uh, dispositions and attitudes and that create positive impact from the interaction in terms of learning and in terms of high quality collaborative um, products. And these principles lead to very differently looking strategies on the part of the agent, like personalized agents, where the strategy of the agent is to show some personal attention to students versus um, displayed openness, where the agent is just showing that many different perspectives are welcome. Both of these look different from one another, and yet they encourage these positive social environments and processes, as well as um, the observation of transactive knowledge exchange. And all of these principles have been validated in studies where we've compared them through a randomized control trial. In order to be able to validate that these principles produce positive impact. Recently, our work started to look more different in that we don't only work on collaboration in online text-based communication, but also in uh, you know, actual face-to-face -face collaborative environments where in this particular image you see there are sensors around the room that are listening in on a face-to-face -face interaction and watching a face-to-face -face interaction. And the support is not through a chat-based conversational agent, but a virtual human who can interact with the team through gaze and gesture and voice. And we use the same architecture for, for um, uh, embedding our strategies for that support, but we bring in multiple channels of collected data from all of the sensors that you see being integrated together and passed to the architecture that manages 
those conversational agents and then channels the direction to the agent, not to just um, contribute a chat um, turn uh, or, or series of turns, but to interact through these multiple channels, as I have said. So we've seen now, let's just recap where we're at in this conversation. We talked about what social meaning is and how it tends to be modeled in natural language processing. And we talked about two different models for thinking about social meaning. One that's easier to model, and that is the social meaning as spice. But then we talked about social meaning as more of being like the wind. And we talked about how it is that you can't see the wind, but you can see what it does. And what it does in this case if we think about the social meaning, the underlying positive aspects of a collaboration that make it work well, we can't see those things directly, but we do see what they do. And one of the things that those underlying social processes and dispositions do is produce these collaborative behaviors like transactivity that help to construct meaning, that help to lead to more learning that produce integrated collaborative results. So we see. Now, you can say that if we talk about social media as this invisible underlying current that's connected to what we see, then if social meaning is a wind, then we can use the symbols that we create that reflect that social meaning to create wind power, to have an impact in an interaction. You can see this in a lot of work in sociolinguistics. For example, here's a book that talks about profanity. Why is it that we believe that some words sound very offensive? We talked about the idea of calling somebody flipper earlier in this talk. There are, in English, there are a whole lot of words. I'm not going to say them in this conversation here. Um, I'm sure that many of you could think of many of those words and maybe also in your own native language. Um, if it's not English, um, every language has them. You can trace the history of attitudes towards those words. And this particular book by Tom McHenry that you see here on this slide talks about the history of those swear words, we call them, in English. And actually, um, rather than argue that those words linguistically are inherently and had to be negative in how they come across, he talks about uh, historically the rise of the middle class in England and how there were struggles between different political parties um, and how it is that in order to suppress certain political views, there was what he calls a moral panic over profanity that created the excuse to censor certain documents that expressed political views that uh, were contrary to the powers that be, let's call them. And so it gave an excuse to censor those. But in the overt discussion in the media about those documents, instead of talking about the political views, because it wouldn't have been socially acceptable to censor them for their views, instead, the focus was, you know, these documents, they have these words in them, they're very offensive, we need to eradicate um, this profanity, it's going to cause problems. And so people were more amenable to actually censoring out certain documents. But it reinforced an idea that those words that were used as the excuse were indeed bad words. And it reinforced a perception of those words over time. And those words became associated with groups that used them and also had these unsavory views. And in this reaction, this moral panic over those words, the distinction between um, economic classes became magnified. 
and that reinforced the perception of those words. So that then those words carried that force. The force that was associated with those words came through these interaction processes. And similar to what I had said earlier on about this arbitrary social meaning, that, that even in metaphors and how we communicate with them, that it's arbitrary but not random, you can see there would be a logic to the progression over time of the attitudes towards these words because of these, these uh, the history makes it make sense and because of the association between these words and particular political views. So what happened is that over time people forgot the association between those words and the political views or the reasons why some people started this moral panic in the media. And over time, it just became the way those words came across until people forgot about the source and just believed that those words themselves were inherently negative. But they didn't start out that way. And so this force behind the words was created through a process of interactions, a series of interactions over time, and became the meaning. So we can create that force, we can use that force, we can perpetuate those meanings over time. An individual interaction may just be a drop in a bucket, but it creates a ripple effect as the patterns that have a specific contextual meaning are taken up and reused, it's reinforced, it becomes bigger and bigger over time. Since we don't know ahead of time that that's going to happen, again, what I had said before is that we won't be able to see um, that it's effective to just say, uh, you know, a list of words, they have these meanings, these are stable meanings, it's changing, it's dynamic over time. But through our interactions, we can channel this force. And many areas of linguistics talk about the way that once a word is associated with a social meaning, it can be used in an interaction to communicate something. And as it becomes wider recognize that there is that force behind the words, the strategies become more codified as well. For how those are used, there are rules of engagement then when you can use those words to achieve certain effects and we see those effects occurring. Nevertheless, we can't fully control all of the interactions that we're in. Uh, Irving Goffman, a famous sociologist, has talked about the difference between what meaning we encode directly, those strategies that we learn, like the design principles of those conversational agents that introduce some scaffolding into an interaction in order to produce more transactive exchange. Nevertheless, there are things that we do in our behavior that we don't have full control over. They reflect things about our internal states. We might be trying to be nice, but maybe we actually hate someone. Maybe we try to hide that, but nevertheless, there might be aspects of how we talk that convey that, even if that isn't what we're trying to convey. And so these things are always happening simultaneously, and they make it more complicated for us for models to be able to detect where people are coming from and what those underlying currents are because we have some choice. We're trying to achieve things, but things are getting mixed in. That means it's hard to decode what was it that we were trying to achieve. And yet doing that decoding process is part of what we do as we're trying to interpret what's happening socially in an interaction. So modeling social meaning is hard. It's hard to separate those things that are intentional from those things that are unintentional. We can call that separating what's given from what's given off in the words of Irving Goffman. Social meaning is also inherently situated within context and therefore not fully generalizable. And because of that, there are lots of specialized usages that are rare that might be missed. 
um, when we build a model, we make an assumption that those things that are frequent are more stable patterns that we can codify. But sometimes the more important social meanings are rare and treated by models as noise, and that's a challenge. Social meaning is systematic. Even Lake Off and Johnson started out with that in their um, presentation of metaphors that we live by. And yet we talked about how it is that it's somewhat arbitrary. We talked about the idea of swear words and how that came through choices that were motivated by a political agenda. If that had not taken place, those words may never have carried the, uh, the impact that they do. And so we see systematicity, but we don't see total top-down order. We see between communities, within that community, there's regularity, but across communities, there might be a different kind of regularity. So these days, there's a lot of work in natural language processing that bases the models on massive stores of text data that are processed, and then those representations that are built out of those are used as the basis of almost everything that we do now in natural language processing. And to the extent that it's important to us to try to extract not just the direct content from texts, but to be able to get at those social meanings, like when we're trying to detect um, offensive language or we're trying to look for evidence of, of biases or stereotypes in how things are conveyed. Will we be able to do that using our techniques or are we inherently limited by the fact that we're defining the world according to a static set of data? And so therefore there are some social meanings that will be captured, but the contexts have been removed. And now we're using it as some generalizable resource in new contexts that maybe it doesn't, doesn't adequately reflect. So there will be, be problems. These are all challenges. So Lakoff and Johnson would say, based on their theory of metaphors we live by, that instead of thinking about static representations of social meaning, that we need to be able to model social meaning in a very personalized, very context sensitive way. But this might be actually too hard. It might challenge us. These things that are difficulties, they, they argue against what we believe when we apply something that we call a model. The models by nature make assumptions about regularities, about frequencies that just might not be consistent with the reality of language. And we might find, therefore, as we try to push the technology to be able to model language at this level, that it's as though we're chasing after the wind. And so instead, I would argue that maybe it makes more sense. Maybe it could be more impactful in the world. If instead we think about this social meaning as wind and try to channel those social processes without actually finding them directly. Now in our work, um, we have produced some resources. I will say I have two PhD students who have very recently defended their dissertations. That's Michael Miller Yoder and Chin Lan Shen. Their dissertations will be coming out by the end of September. And they both um, will talk about, if you believe that we need to address this challenge, what does that mean about what we should do? Both of their dissertations really push on this issue. And you can come to me and ask you know, for uh, access to these. And when they're ready, I'll be happy to send those. In the meantime, there are some publications that you can take a look at. One was an article in Nature that talks about um, why it is that there are limitations with the current modeling approaches of social meaning and what it what we would require in order to feel satisfied with an approach.
You can also find a computational linguistics journal article that's a survey of work, foundational work in language technologies that um, about trying to get at social meaning. And it also kind of in line with this talk, talks about a future vision of what we would need to be able to address as a field in order to reach these this level of sensitivity and language. Um, there are also resources you can find if you go to our dance website, that's dance.cs.cmu.edu. Um, and you can see the name of our website here, Discussion Affordances for Natural Collaborative Exchange. You can search for that on Google. Here you can find um, some resources that were developed for being able to build systems like our a natural language processing a support for collaboration, both now in text-based interaction and in face-to-face -face interaction. So um, you can see, uh, if you go to the resources page, that there are um, some resources specific to massive open line, online courses, but others that are more general, like LightSide, that's a text mining tool bench, um, a social recommendation engine that can be integrated with um, discussion forums, um, infrastructure for storing interaction data to prepare it for interac uh, interaction analysis, um, the bizarre architecture for being able to offer the context sensitive and interactive support that I've talked about in this talk. So feel free to reach out for those resources, reach out to us for collaboration, my contact information and my website, both my personal website and the dance website, you can see here on this slide. And now I will close this talk and I'm open to any questions from the audience. I can't actually see the chat from where, uh, from my screen. So I invite people to uh, jump in. If uh, the facilitators of this talk want to say, uh, uh, read uh, questions to me, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rosier. It's time for some questions. Um, Nacho R is, is asking you, is saying you, hi, I have a question. How to deal with personality traits that are potentially incompatible with collaborative work? How, how some agents can adapt the workflow, the workflow to those individuals and trying to get the best of them? So um, what we see is that it is true that across individuals, there are different levels of collaborative skill. If you look across the field of computer-supported collaborative learning, there are uh, many different kinds of scaffolding to try to show people what are more positive collaborative behaviors and try to support those behaviors. In our work, the, the transactivity-based team formation what we're leveraging is the idea that even if a person has poor collaborative skills, depending upon their attitude towards individual others, sometimes they will behave better and sometimes they will behave worse. Similarly, for people whose baseline level of collaborative behavior is high, even those students or or even outside of the learning context, those people, um, depending upon who they're working with, will sometimes treat people better and sometimes treat people worse in terms of what we would expect uh, from a collaborative group. So what we're trying to do in the team formation is detect whether there is that level of respect and um, that level of interest that would create the environment in which two people together would behave at their optimal level. And so that is not actually addressing the personality issue that you're mentioning here. But the personality issue can be addressed through more overt scaffolding, like um, uh, uh, actually a modeling using the agent, for example, what would be appropriate behavior or detecting that inappropriate behavior has occurred and pointing it out and then asking for a rephrase. So that kind of scaffolding can be also introduced into the interaction. That would be separate 
from just setting up the team for success ahead of time um, based on the team assignment. Thank you. Also, Nacho R is saying, I mean, Certain psychology, psychological factors make individuals more difficult to work in teams, although they have probably high potential. The, the course of this psych are varied and difficult to treatments, but the need of having better opportunity is still there for them. Yes, there are definitely those people. I think we all know people who are hard to work with. Um, and. So again, um, there's also uh, another approach besides detecting the behavior, pointing it out and asking for different behavior or trying to put them in an environment where they behave better anyway. There's also training. There's also kind of uh, introducing reflection after a collaboration. I've worked with some colleagues on um, um, uh, alternating teamwork and then reflection on the teamwork and then coming back into the team again. And so there's an article uh, with one of my colleagues, Marcella Borges, where we were working in the context of a collaborative course. And what we found is that over time, having gone through this alternating, working together, then reflecting and getting feedback, then working together again, then reflecting and getting feedback again, the students behaved better, more in line with the expected desirable collaborative behavior because of the feedback that they got. So that's another approach to trying to deal with these personality problems. But there are some people that nevertheless, uh, uh, even after training, even uh, with support, still are more difficult to deal with than others. So we don't have a solution that makes everyone excellent at collaboration. What we can just do is try to take people from where they are to something a little bit better than that. Thank you. Carlos Aranda is asking you, have you tried to implement a kind of memory on the model? to follow up all this change in the context? Yes, to some extent, um, we do have, as part of the architecture, some registers that, that keep track of the state of, uh, of, of a session. So it could, it could be registers like where, where in the whole session are we so that we know, for example, what activities people should be working on at what point. But we can also say, um, how much has each student contributed to this interaction since the beginning or since a certain key point in order to know, to be able to say, oh, I have noticed that this student hasn't talked in the past 10 minutes, then I'm, maybe I need to draw that person in. So we, we do have um, certain registers that keep track of state as it evolves over time because things are changing and it's not just what just happened that matters, but it's what happened over time. Thank you. I would like to, to ask you, uh, that this is, this is a very interesting topic, but which is the, the, starting, the starting point for a student to, to, to start in this, to work in this, in this topic? Oh, that what is they, want, they have to, to study, what they had to study. So I would say that there are a lot of important areas of research that come into play. Um, one important area is to learn about sociolinguistics. That's the, the human side of language communication. And I referred in this talk to some work in that area. So the work on appraisal in English, the work on swearing in English, they come from the field of sociolinguistics. And I would say that's one area to, to delve into. Um, but apart from that, there's also um, formal linguistics in terms of the structure of language. Um, and there, I think it's important to understand about syntax and formal semantics so that we understand something about the layers of lasagna, as I referred to before. That's a separate field from sociolinguistics that has more of its roots in sociology. But then natural language processing builds on machine learning. And for that, it's really important to understand um, a lot of math um, and also software engineering and also just work in the area of machine learning formally. 
those things all come together into those technical skills. And then the two sides need to come together. And then that is only the artificial intelligence aspect of all of this. But in order to be able to use it, in order to achieve an impact on learning, it's also important to understand learning processes and instructional design. And so that comes into play as well. So I think the question of where to start is a really important one. I think that um, it's probably impossible for a student to learn all of these fields all at once, it, even in the course of a PhD, to try to learn multiple fields is probably too much. So it would be better for a student to pick um, a, 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 an interdisciplinary team to be part of where these multiple areas of expertise are represented and where that student can focus on one of these, but in the context of collaboration across the different areas so that the student can be exposed to all of these fields, but can become an expert in one. Thank you. Thank you for, for your question to answer. Uh, we have so many comments about your, your talk, very nice talk, outstanding talk. Thank you very much for that. that talk. So um, uh, we, we, I would like to, to thank you, Professor Rossier, to be here with us today. Uh, I hope you have, to have you in, in future events of the uh, society, Mexican society, hopefully in person, in person. Yeah. Someday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We have 